Okay, so take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. So what I want to share tonight is it is not good for man to be alone, and man being male or female, that it is not, and this is a profound statement, and it's a statement that we need to take to heart. I mean, you think about this. For, for a minute, God has created this perfect world. This world, this world that he's created is peaceful. It's got everything that it needs, all the food, the animals are all in harmony. And he creates this man and he's in paradise. And yet even in paradise, God's looking at it and says, it's not good for man to be alone. Even under the most idyllic physical conditions, God says it's not good for man to be alone. That's not a good condition. And what I want to kind of talk about tonight, and I've got several sections of Scripture we'll go to, but, but I kind of want to think about this in, in terms of a broad spectrum of of life and ideas that we can take this message. It is not good for man to be alone and apply it in so many areas of life. So let me begin with thinking about marriage and family. You know, it's, uh, it's possible to be alone. Certainly we think of, you know, a single person living by themselves as being alone, but it's very common even for people in a marriage to be alone, to feel alone, to feel disconnected from one another, to not be unified, intimate, and, and fulfilling for one another that thing that the Lord said, that it's not good for the man to be alone. The, the, the thing he says right after, I will make a helper as his compliment, that I'm going to have a companion and they're going to be companions together. And, and so even in a marriage or family, brothers, sisters, parents, children, husband, wife, even in, at that level, it's very possible for people to be alone, even living together, to, to feel a sense of aloneness. And a lot of times I think, in too, especially in our society, that we don't even realize how alone we are. When people come from other countries over to the United States that come from cultures that are, are, have much more connectedness amongst people, where people are, they're not alone, certainly. They're, they, they're, they have tightly woven societies and families and, and connected communities. And then they come over here and what they, what they say about our society is that, that we are very alone. And in fact, I remember Lisa was reading something, it seems like she was reading or maybe it was a documentary, I don't remember now. Some time ago it was about a woman who had come from Africa, from a small, you know, poor village in Africa where they lived in huts. And she came to the United States and she had this nice apartment or house or whatever it was. And if I recall correctly, she eventually decided to, to go back to the village in Africa, even though it was very poor, the conditions were, were somewhat difficult because she couldn't stand how alone she felt. And I remember, uh, I may have actually told this story because I got this out of the, um, 
the book Misreading Scripture Through Western Eyes that I talked about a while back. But I remember this story he tells that D.H. Lawrence talked about that when he was, uh, you know, during the uh, World War I and he was helping the Arabs fight the Turks and what they would do is they would ambush trains, Turkish train, military trains. And the way that they would do it is they would, they would blow up some tracks they, and then they would wait for the military train to come along and get stopped. And then they would ambush the train and kill all the, the soldiers. And so they, in this one place, they decided, okay, here's what they were going to do. They set up a machine gun nest that was hidden and he assigned a couple of, of soldiers to, to man the machine gun nest. And then the rest of them went down, they blew up the tracks, and then they, they went off and they hid. And the idea was that the guys in the uh, machine gun nest were supposed to wait. What would happen is the soldiers would come out and they would kind of check things out, try and see you know, if it was safe. And then if they felt like it was safe, then the workers would come out and they would fix the, the track. So the idea was to wait until the workers were all out there fixing the track and then hit them with the machine gun. And once they had kind of mowed them down some of the machine gun, the rest of the guys would run in and finish it off. So, so they blow up the tracks, they go off and hide. And pretty soon the train comes along, it stops. They see the soldiers get out, you know, where Lawrence was with the guys that he was with, they saw the soldiers get out, they look around, they don't see anything. So then the workers get out and they start repairing the tracks and they repair the tracks and they repair the tracks. And finally they get the tracks fixed and the train goes on. And so he's like, you know what, he's wondering what happened? What, why didn't they, the two guys I put in the machine gun nest, why didn't they shoot these guys? So they go back over to where he had left the two guys in the machine gun nest he gets over there and they're gone. And so they go off in search of these guys. They finally find him in a village a little ways off. And he said, he asked him, why did you leave? And they said, well, we got lonely. And, and it, they, the, in the book, they, they used it, that story as an illustration of how close and how connected. Here's two guys. It wasn't one guy in a machine gun nest. There were two guys in the machine gun nest and they felt like they felt lonely, just the two of them. So they left and went off to go find companionship, <laughs> two of them. And so I don't think we have, I mean, we don't have any idea of what life is truly like in a really, truly connected culture and society. And so God says it is not good for man to be alone. And, and he created marriage and he created families to take care of that. But, but we, have, we have lost that connectedness. We're still alone, even in our marriage and families, frequently. And, um, but then even, you know, in the wider culture, so often uh, in churches, you can go into a church and people can be in the church. I remember, I... I I'll never forget, we, uh, we were going to this one church here in the area. Lisa had gotten sick. You know, we, we'd sort of kind of commuted twice a month down to Nashville to a fellowship down there. And then gas prices got really high and, and we stopped going. And, and we really weren't doing anything. And Lisa got really sick and we decided we've got to do something. So we decided, you know, we'd go to a church, which we, neither of us had done in our adult lives. And, and so we, we started going to this church and the people were really nice. It was a small charismatic church and it was, um, you know, the people were very friendly and uh, it, it was, it was helpful at the time, at least to a certain extent. But I'll never forget every Sunday we wanted to go eat with people after the, the, the church. And, and so we would, we would start asking people after the church, do you want to go to lunch? And frequently we, it would take us asking two, three, four, five, six, 
or not at all, different people or couples or families or whatever before we would find somebody who would say, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, let's go to lunch. All those other people before that, well, we've got, we can't, we've got some stuff we got to do back at the house kind of thing. And, and, you know, time after time, we finally found like two or three people in the church that really did want to connect. And we actually started a, a, a weekly Bible study with them. And, uh, but, but there was so much loneliness. People weren't connected. They go to church on Sunday and then they, and they were real loving towards each other while they were at the church and then they leave and that'd be it. There's nothing outside of that. And, you know, we, we actually have a phrase in our culture that is one of those defining phrases of Americans. And that's rugged individualism. Right? That we, we actually pride ourselves on an individual's ability to succeed and survive and endure on their own merits and, you know, pulling up their own bootstraps and doing it themselves. You know, we, we have, all, all, we have another phrase, do it yourself. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, all that kind of stuff. And so it permeates our culture. And so we are closed off to each other and we see this manifested where we're not, we're not open with one another. We're not, we're not involved in each other's lives. In fact, Americans view it as, as being nosy and rude and inappropriate. And what are you doing all up in my business? You know, kind of thing. And that doesn't exist in other cultures. One of the other things that was really interesting in the book, Misreading Scripture Through Western Eyes, is uh, one of the guys who was a missionary in Indonesia he said that he could, at the little Bible college where he taught at in Indonesia, on any given morning, he could stop any student on campus and ask them what his wife was going to make him for lunch, and they would know, and they would know if she had paid too much at the market for it. <laughs> and... You know, he said it's that, you know, that, um, that kind of intimacy in the society that they, they were not alone. There was no aloneness. In fact, a, a, a aloneness was something to be dreaded, absolutely dreaded. And yet in our culture, we prize it. You know, oh, I'm looking forward to my alone time. There's no such concept in many Eastern cultures. And, and so we have to kind of, we look at our culture, we look at our other cultures, and we want a biblical worldview, we have to say, what does God have to say about this? And God says, it is not good for the man to be alone. Right? It's not good for us to be alone. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And we're going to go all the way down to verse 43. We'll start there. Acts chapter 2, verse 43 says, Then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all, as anyone had a need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together and breaking bread from house to house. They were not alone. They recognized as a community they needed to, to <laughs> tightly weave themselves into each other's lives, that they needed each other. They, uh, they needed to help each other. They needed to fellowship together. They needed to eat together. They needed to spend time together. They needed to talk. They needed to be aware 
of what's going on in each other's lives so that they could help one another, so they could love one another. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, verses 24 and 25. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, And let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works, not staying away from our worship meetings as some habitually do, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, the day of the Lord drawing near. Let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. That we're, we're, we need to think about each other and we need to encourage each other. And encourage each other, loving each other, encouraging each other to love and to be involved with one another. And again, I want you to think about this in broad spectrum per perspective. Not just our fellowship here or a fellowship that you go to in your local area, but your family, your neighbors, your coworker, you know, anybody that you're connected to, how do you get more connected to them? To drive out the aloneness that our culture breeds that God says is not good. How do I get closer to my spouse? You know, the fundamental thing that God did to solve that problem was my spouse. Now, if you don't have a spouse, you need a friend that's your, your close companion, you know, your, your bosom buddy. You need somebody. You know, we don't always have the best conditions. You know, you might have a, a marriage that has been bad, for instance. Well, how do you make it good? How do you get to that good place, right? And if you have a good marriage, how do you get better? Because here's the thing. Our culture is constantly driving wedges between people. Look at, look at the culture at large and how divided we are as a society today. Look at John chapter 14. Jesus said he would not leave us alone. John chapter 14, and starting in verse 16, Jesus said, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. It is the Spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive it because it doesn't see it or know it. But you do know it because it remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. So we know that even now, when we're separated from Jesus Christ and God in a, in a physical sense, one day we won't be, he didn't, he didn't leave us alone. He sent the Holy Spirit, baptizes us in Holy Spirit, so that we have that connection with him. So even when I am alone, I can still have that intimate connection with the Lord. You think about Paul after he was arrested in Jerusalem. It says the Lord came to him and spoke to him and comforted him. He was not alone. Look at John chapter 13. And we'll wrap up with these verses. John chapter 13, starting in verse 34. I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And he's talking about some pretty serious love because he says the kind of love he's talking about is the kind of love that sent him to the cross. You know, sacrificial love. A deep, deep love. A love that that says, you know, I will do anything for you. I will take care of you. That same kind of love that the disciples had there at the end of Acts, where they sold their possessions to take care of anybody who had any needs. 
to make sure that everybody was cared for. That kind of love. The kind of love that, uh, um, like, Paul had where he, I don't know if he knew that the Lord was going to work this way, but he was, in Philippi, he was beaten and thrown in jail without any formal charges, which was illegal to do to a Roman citizen. And, and yet he never said anything, not till the next day. He, after the whole earthquake incident, all that stuff, he doesn't say anything until later. Even though he per, knew perfectly well what his rights were as a Roman citizen. That, they, that was not okay for them to do that. And yet he doesn't say anything. He allowed himself to be beaten. Let me ask you this. If you knew that it was your right under the law to not be beaten, by the officials, and that in fact, if you were unlawfully beaten, that the punishment would be they would be beaten and could lose their position and all kinds of stuff, right? It was very serious. If you knew that and, and an official was about to beat you, wouldn't you say something? Absolutely, you would say something. And yet Paul doesn't say anything. He allows himself to be beaten and thrown in the prison. But we know the rest of the story. We know that the rest of the story is the the Philippian jailer and his whole family get saved. Paul was looking for not aloneness. He was looking for those people who were going to join his family. And he was willing to be beaten to be with them. It's that kind of love that Jesus is talking about. And so we really have got, and and I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody, because I, I, I am in this culture of aloneness as deep as anybody else. I mean, it's, you know, Lisa and I, you know, it, it, we, we don't have at least in the past, especially, we, have, we haven't had a lot in common. You know, we, we you know, I, some of you know our, our story of how we came to be married, but basically God arranged our marriage. Uh, individually told us each, marry that one. And, um, and it, it was an odd kind of put together thing because we, we didn't have a lot in common. And, uh, and I, I was very much not Lisa's type. And, um, but, but we had the, we had God in common. We had the Bible in common. And for many years, the only things we had in common was God, Christianity, the word of God and our kids. And that was it. And, um, and it was very easy for us to just be alone in our marriage. And over a number of years now, we really, you know, tried to, to, to fix that situation and to develop things that, you know, in common, interests in common, but really bring ourselves closer and closer together in oneness to not be alone. Now, I don't think that we've necessarily thought about it that way, but, but certainly we wanted a better marriage, all that kind of stuff. We wanted to be, um, uh, uh, you know, the way God designed a marriage of, of two people coming to be one. But, but the thing is, is that it's, you know, yeah, you want that in your marriage, but as a Christian family, we're supposed to be like that with one another. We're so, it's supposed to be sto- so stark that other people look at it and go, wow, those people are different. And that they know they're, that, that we stand out so much in our love for one another that people look at us and they say, that's, that's Jesus. That whole Christianity thing that I always heard about that, you know, the religiosity and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't like that, but you know, everybody, this is the thing. When you go out and you interview people who are are not Christians and you say, what do you think about Christianity? uh, Very frequently the reaction is negative. 
you know, they're thinking hypocrites and religiousness and stuff like that. And then they ask, uh, well, what do you think about Jesus? And the answer is, oh, he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah, Jesus. Oh, he's, he, was, he was a great man. And, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. I admit, you know, Jesus, he's, he said great things, right? Well, <laughs> the, the church, us, we're supposed to be reflecting Jesus. We're his ambassadors. We're supposed to be showing Jesus to each other. And Jesus said the way we do that is through our love for one another. And it's that love for one another, the deep connectedness, the willingness to be vulnerable with one another, the willingness to be in each other's lives and involved with one another and know what's going on with each other and praying for one another, loving, taking care of needs with, with each other and marriages and families and friendships and in our church that, that we stand out to others who are outsiders and they're looking in and they're going, that is so awesome. I want that. And, and that we are feeling like how God intended for Adam to feel in paradise, that all other conditions were met. Everything was perfectly good, but it wasn't good enough because he was alone. So it doesn't matter anything else about your life. Doesn't matter what the conditions are. If you're alone, it's a bad situation. If you're, if you're not feeling connected, and I, again, I don't care whether you're single or married. You can feel just as alone in a marriage as you can being single. You can feel just as alone being in a church as you can not having a church. So to finish up, we need to strive for connectedness with each other. We need to, to purposefully enter into each other's lives to love one another, encourage each other, to help one another. And, and again, one another, I'm saying it to this group here, and that's true for this group here, but it's also true in our homes, our families, our communities. We need to not be alone. And now I'll, I'll open it up for discussion. Considering those who complain about the church being full of hypocrites, you know, say, well, come on, we can use another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come and join us. Yeah. Well, I was impressed, John, when you told those two gentlemen that came to film the video, do the video thing, and when they needed a place to stay, and you said, oh, yeah, come on in, and you already had 25 people staying there. <laughs> uh, and now some people wouldn't even consider two extra people in their home, rather than, you know, I mean, you had a house, you had more than a house full. We did have a house full. <laughs> But you said, come on in, and I'm sure that that impressed them, too. You know what's funny about that, Carol? What? What's funny about that, we had, a, we had more people staying here than, than we've ever had, a lot more. I mean, they were staying here. When we've had conferences here, most of the people didn't stay here. They right. stayed in local hotels. <laughs> we're going to change that next time. Uh, it, was, it was tangibly different, where it, it's what Lisa was talking about at the beginning, um, how just how awesome it was to have everybody together like that. Okay. Cool. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, Nicole had her hand up. People slept out on the uh, by the pool. <laughs> I was just gonna say that's a really good teaching because I'm super guilty of that because I get so distracted with Lydia and just doing her everyday stuff that it makes me like today it's funny that you did this teaching because when i was cooking dinner i was like wow i haven't talked to one of my friends in like two weeks i'm like oh my gosh that's really bad like <laughs> i need to contact her she's still alive like i mean you just you just get caught up in your normal everyday routine and stuff and you just i mean you just it it just happens you just just keep doing this automatic thing and so, um, yeah, that's something I'm actually going to try working on because I'm super guilty of that. 
Yeah, me too. Uh, Donna Catuli had her hand up. Yeah, I think there's these two women. Well, I had a whole, whole woman's fellowship that I work with, but um, these two particular women, um, for the last three years that I know of, actually it's all their life, but I'm just going to narrow it down to what I've been doing. I tried to encourage them in getting into a church of sorts and um, they don't get it. And so they're always alone, always, you know, and, and they wonder why, you know, it's kind of like, good Lord, you want to heighten your anxiety, be alone. And I said to him, this is why recovery people have one another because they get each, you know, I get the aha about you and it's a helpful thing uh, because when you have supporters, you're apt to do much more than uh, than alone you know in that individual ruggedness and you know again i always say to these women who do you have who do you have in your home who do you have to turn to but you you know and you get nowhere if you're in trouble and so it's really a it's almost like a poison that you know we've got all this communication and yet we're more alone than ever because I just really think that we're relational. God made us relational people so that we can be in communities and cultivate relationship with all kinds of different people. Yeah. You know, I, a, a while back, Charlie Preston turned me on to this uh, thing that it was a study that was done in the 1970s where a uh, for many many years studies have been done on addictive substance substances on rats and the the typical study would go kind of like this they they put a rat in a cage and they they give two water bottles one that would be laced with uh, you know an opiate heroin or something you know uh, and then the other one would just be straight water. And what would happen is pretty quickly the rat would become addicted to the drug water and would, you know, just constantly be, and in, depending on the drug, you know, may kill themselves on the drug kind of thing. And over and over and over again, the experiment just showed how easy it was for the rat to become addicted. So, a researcher, you know, was uh, was going to do some studies on this, and he thought, you know, I've done some studies with the rats, but here's the thing about this, is that rats don't live alone in a cage. That's not natural or normal. So he decided to try a different kind of experiment where he built a rat community. Uh -huh. And he had a bunch of rats of different ages and you know, sexes and stuff. And, and he had, um, he had a lot of activities for the rats and plenty of food for the rats. And, um, so there was a lot of, a lot of community, a lot of stimulation. Rats are communal animals. That's one of the reasons why they, they actually, I don't know if you guys know this, they make great pets, except that they don't live very long. They're as smart as a dog is. You can teach them tricks. They can learn their name. Uh, they'll come when they're called. Um, they're amazing little animals, and uh, but they're very communal. And and so he he made this big thing for them, and then he did the the experiment. He took the two water bottles, one with water, and one with the the drug in it, and none of the rats would take the drug. They might come over and try it, but then they they ignore that and they go to the water. No rats became addicted. He could take an addicted rat, put it in the, the rat community, and it would come off the drug. And uh, uh, Charlie had sent this to me, you know, talking about how sad it is that these experiments were done in the 1970s, and people still don't get how to, to get somebody off drugs has to do with building a good community. You were talked about that. It certainly like in the 12 step program for AA and stuff like that community is very important. 
having that buddy system where you're 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 close with your your buddy who's going to help you to um, you know to stay sober you know all that kind of stuff but but it's that aloneness and 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 really people who are depressed um, you know that a big contributor to those kinds of conditions are are is that aloneness it's and that well they can't they can't hear you way over there uh, so um, well if you want to talk you're gonna to have to come over here uh, so um, um, you know the the there's so much of the the mental health issues in our society I believe are tied to this problem that God outlines in Genesis chapter two. It is not good for man to be alone. I think uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.